Hi, Hi students. students, welcome back. So in this video, we're going to take a look at experimental methods, which is going to be very similar to uh, what you see in practical. Uh, so all the experiments that we're doing in practical, right, can be broadly classified into two different kinds of methods. First of which is called the continuous method. The other one is called the discontinuous method. We're going to run you through both of them. So Mr. Tim, if I talk about continuous methods, right, mm -hmm. what are the things that comes to your mind immediately? Oh, the, the, the word continuous mm. sounds like you're tracking something continuously with time. Right. So in the idea of kinetics, reaction kinetics, what we're actually tracking is the concentration of mm. a reactant mm -hmm. with time, okay? So we have this here. Now, um, I'm just going to bring you through this with me, Mr. Leong. Mm. So depending on this, the shape of this curve, right? Right. Just remind me, um, if it's zero order, how does this shape look like? So reactant time graph must always be decreasing. So okay. if it's zero order, it'll be a downward sloping straight line. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you guys can remember, if it's a curve, a downward sloping curve, it's either first, it's either second, all That's right? right. All right, so like what Mr. Leong said, this is kind of a practical um, experiment. So how do we apply this continuous method? Now. We're going to take example one, okay, and look at this. We are taking propanol and you're reacting with iodine in the presence of H plus catalyst, okay? So again, our aim here is to find the order of reaction mm. with respect to iodine, all right? So again, look at this, look at this setup here. We're going to add propanol, we're going to add iodine. Now remember, your goal is to find out how much the concentration of unreacted iodine mm. as regular time intervals, okay? So for example, these regular time intervals are T1, T2, T3, let's say 5, 10, 15 seconds respectively, all right? So at 5 seconds, I look, I look at my stopwatch when 5 seconds has passed, I'm going to use a pipette, I'm going to sample out and take out a small portion, I'm going to add it into a conical flask. Now what I'm going to do here is this, I need to make sure that the reaction stops, okay? I need to stop the reaction, and how do I do that? We quench it, quenching just means stopping, by adding in sodium hydrogen carbonate, which is a base, which destroys my H+, via acid-base reaction, so my reaction stops. And then from there, I can find out how much unreacted iodine I have by a simple iodine thiosulfate titration, right? So from this, I can do this a couple more times. So at 10 seconds, at 15 seconds, and what I will do now is this. I'll plot the volume of thiosulfate used for each time regular interval, right? And you see this here. Volume of thiosulfate against time. So for example, 5 seconds or 5 minutes in this case, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but Mr. Long, you can see something's a bit awkward here, mm. right? So by right, uh, originally when we talk about plotting the graph, it should be the concentration of the reactants. Oh, uh, but yeah. this one, it seems to be talking about a different reaction altogether, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. We are finding out the volume of thiosulfate now. Yeah. So how does that relate back? But we know this, right? Because volume of thiosulfate, the more unreacted iodine you have, then the more volume of thiosulfate you need for titration. Mm -hmm. So which means you can see that the kind of proportional, the volume and hence the amount of thiosulfate is proportional to the amount of unreacted iodine, mm -hmm. all right? So plotting this graph is as almost as good as plotting concentration of unreacted iodine, okay? And Mr. Leong, looking at this shape of this curve mm -hmm. on this line, mm. what order does it tell you? So respect it's a downward sloping straight line, it mm -hmm. must be zero order with respect to I2. Exactly, so mm. you can see here, zero order with respect to I2, all right? So this was a continuous method. Now, if it's discontinuous, how do I do that, Mr. Leo? So continuous method, you are only just performing one experiment. Okay. So for this continuous, it probably means that I don't have anything much to do with time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to perform multiple experiments, uh, but now I'm going to change a certain variable. So in this case, perhaps I'm going to change the concentration of a particular reactant, and I want to see what is the impact on their initial rate. So this feels a bit familiar uh, because all this kind of information that you collect from the experiments is like your tabular method, right? Mm. Uh, you're tell me, telling me that the different concentration will end up with a different uh, rate and then you do comparison or you do the inspection method uh, in, in order to find out the order of the reaction. So here we're going to see how this is being done in the experiment. So let's take a look at a particular reaction that I want. Okay? Um, in this case, I'm looking out for uh, H2O2 reacting with iodine in uh, uh, S uh, iodide in acidic medium, and my objective over here is to find out the order of reaction with respect to hydrogen peroxide, okay, H2O2. Mm -hmm. So you tell me that, hey, this is a very good experiment because the product is going to be a brown iodine. So you say that, hey, I think I can very easily tell uh, when the reaction is complete just by seeing how fast your iodine is being produced. But the problem about this reaction uh, is that this reaction happens very quickly. You tell me that, hey, the moment you add the reactants inside, straight away you're going to see the brown color. Even though you change the concentration, the reaction won't be too far, uh, won't, be, won't, won't change the time too much. So therefore you say that, mm, perhaps, right, I like to think of a way to delay the color from appearing. 
So Mr. Tim, what would you suggest that I do to delay this color? Well, we can take it and react with something. Okay. Right? So we're going to add in this new reagent called the thiosulfate, S2O3 2-. Uh, that, uh, when you add in thiosulfate by a fixed amount, right, you are actually going to delay the color from appearing. So there is at least some sort of a lag so that you can at least react to it. When you do your, clock, uh, your, your stopwatch, right, you have this time delay so that you at least can measure uh, uh, at what point of time did the iodine color really appear. Okay, so in the experiment itself, let me just briefly run you through. Uh, the conical flask and the beaker is going to contain two different things. When I mix them together, then the reaction will begin. So in the conical flask, it's going to contain my hydrogen peroxide as well as my acid to acidify the environment. Uh, inside the beaker at the top, you contain your iodide, thiosulfate, and starch as well. Now, starch is present uh, is because um, it is to help to make the color change much more distinct. Uh, starch reacts with iodine to give me what color? A blue black. Color. Yes, a dark color, right, which is very distinct. Mm -hmm. So later on, you can see this very clearly. Okay, so Mr. Tim, could you show me uh, the video of what is going to happen if I add these two together? Hey, sure. um, this is exactly what is happening in the, uh, these are the reactants that are, that are present inside the conical flask. So uh, Mr. Tim, would you play the video? So as you add this in, um, there is going to be a magnetic stirrer at the bottom. This is to ensure homogeneous mixing. So you see that the, the color did not appear after a while. This is your time delay so that mm -hmm. at least you can react to it, right? Yep. So at this point of time, I'm timing it. Right? And we're going to see how long it takes for it to turn uh, uh, dark brown of that color. And you can see this color change is actually very immediate. Straight away it changes, straight away you should stop your stopwatch. Mm -hmm. okay? So using the time, that will allow me to find out the initial rate. Uh, we use the idea of uh, 1 over time to find out the initial rate. And what we're going to do over here is we are going to plot the graph. Okay? Uh, we are going to do this for, we are going to do multiple of these experiments using different concentration of H2O2. Right? So remember last time when we talked about kinetics, if you want to find the order with respect to H2O2, you must vary that concentration. So I'm going to perform perhaps five experiments with five different concentrations of H2O2, find out this initial rate. Uh, the initial rate is going to be inversely proportional to time, and we're going to plot the graph. And of course, depending on the shape of the graph, you should be able to deduce the order of the reaction. Okay, so this whole thing is known as the iodine clock experiment, and usually this is done in a discontinuous method, meaning that you have to perform multiple experiments with varying concentration. From there, you take a look at how it affects the rate. Okay, so that's it. So hopefully you can bring this in into your practical as well as you're doing some kinetics experiments. Think about whether is it continuous and discontinuous and look at what are the graphs that you're drawing mm -hmm. and use it to link it back into the theory, right? We have seen this in the very first video. Uh, the different shapes of the graph would give you different order of reactions. Yep. Okay, so that's it. Thanks everyone. See you guys.